source is one. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So on a night like this, let us try to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Conversate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't have to always come to Allah when you need something. Talk to Him. Talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ask Him, tell Him, this is what, how I'm feeling. This is what I want from you, O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Now I want to ask you guys a question. Does this enjoining good and forbidding evil? Like for example, Samir, my good friend here, he sees me doing something that I'm not supposed to do. He comes up to me and he says, listen, Ali, listen, you're not supposed to do this. You know, this is something that is forbidden in Islam. I say to him, man, this guy's a hater. This guy's a hater. He's hating on me. And it's not your role to judge me. So please, you know, do you, my friend? I'm going to do what I want to do. So does enjoining good and forbidding evil, does it align with the trends of today? Nowadays, in our society, which is individualistic, when somebody does something, they expect no one else to tell them what to do, right? Even for the parents and attendants, they can probably attest to it. That when, when their children want to do something, they want them to stay out of their life. You know, you tell them this is better for you. This is good for you. Listen to, no, no, my parents are old school. They don't know what's going on. I'm, we're the new generation. We know what's going on. So a lot of times, even on social media, and especially there, we find that if somebody tries to enjoin good and forbid evil, to, to talk to their friends, to be the one who is a reasonable voice in that group, they tell them that, listen, you know, we don't want you, you know, you don't give me good vibes. And something of that nature. But in Islam, enjoining good and forbidding evil is seen as a service to, to the other person. So don't think of it that you're taking this person and he's having fun, for example. He's listening to music and he's having fun. And you want to tell them, no, no, it's haram to listen to music. Don't think of it as, oh man, now I'm going to tell him he can't listen to music anymore. He's going to be upset. He's going to look at me. He's going to say, why are you the one? You're the one who killed my mood. You're the one who did one, two, three to me. Rather, look at it from a different perspective. And that is that you're protecting this person's akhirah, not their dunya. The dunya is a transient life. The dunya. This life, which we live in, is like a bridge that hadith say. It's like a bridge. You're crossing from one point to the other. And nobody would take a bridge as their permanent home. In the sense that the way you act should indicate that there's a day of accounting that you're going to go towards on the, in, on the day of judgment. And on that day, everything will be seen. And everything will be shown. And so we should work towards... A life that will be productive here and in the afterlife. Because those are the ones who are successful. In one of the verses, to, to emphasize the extent of you know, what the person will see on the day of judgment, it says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. These are the evil people. They say, مَا لِهَذَا الْكِتَابِ لَا يُغَادَرْ صَغِيرًا وَلَا كَبِيرًا إِلَّا أَحْصَاهِ What? What book is this? What kind of book is this? They will say on the day of judgment. This book did not leave out anything. The small details and the big details. Everything was brought forth in front of us. And so we, in order to be successful on that day, we have to protect ourselves. And then we have to protect our community. We have to protect one another. We have to make sure that our friends are praying, we have to make sure that our friends are doing what they're supposed to do and staying away from that which they're supposed to stay away from. Now, some of the benefits for this act mentioned in the narration is that the one who does Amr bil Ma'roof wa Nahi an al Munkar, they have a sound dunya and akhirah. Sound in the sense that they have a good 
life in this world and in the hereafter. And they have the aid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on their side. A beautiful narration mentions that doing al-amr bil-ma'roof wa nahi an al-munkar does not cut away from one's sustenance, the rizq. And it doesn't bring closer death. And in a final one, it prevents one from falling into the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah, before we get into the majlis, there's a small story that I want to talk to you guys about. In Surah Al-A'raf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a beautiful lesson for us to learn from. He mentions a story from the tribe of Banu Israel. Banu Israel are the children of Israel. Israel in the Quran for those who don't know, is the prophet Jacob, which is Yaqub. So his children faced, are mentioned a, a, a lot of times in the Holy Quran. In this specific story, Allah mentions the story of those who went and transgressed against Allah on the day of Saturday. So on the day of Saturday, it was supposed to be a day and a sabt in Arabic, if you look at it linguistically, from a linguistic perspective, it means resting. It means peace, tranquility. So it doesn't, it's, it's meant to be a day where you're not working. And so this group of people in the time that Allah mentions, Allah says he tested them. And he said to them that you guys are, and they, li they lived on, on the shore next to the sea. And they would hunt for a living. That, that's what they used to do, they would hunt. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbid them from hunting on Saturday. That's the first thing Allah did. He told them, do not hunt on Saturday. So in the beginning, some of them followed, some of them tried to find loopholes. So Allah told them, don't hunt, don't catch fish in the river or in the sea. So what did they do? They created small ponds that, that the sea would pass by, small ponds on the side, and they would open way for the sea and the water to come into those ponds. So that way, they would do this on, on, on like Friday. So on Saturday, they would have the small ponds on the side and the fish would naturally, because they're flowing in the water, they would fall into these ponds. And on Sunday, they would, they would go in and they would catch those fish. That way, they're not hunting on Saturday, but they created this loophole. So then they created this loophole. Slowly, they get desensitized. And this is the problem. When somebody commits something haram, in our narrations, it says, this is not physically, but it mentions that a black dot is placed on their heart. Not this physical heart. But a black dot is placed on their spiritual heart. And slowly, if this person doesn't repent, it will build, it will build, it will build. And eventually they can get to a point where they don't, they're not open, they're not receptive to religion anymore. So to go back to these people, they got desensitized. And slowly they started fishing even on Saturday, then they didn't care anymore. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we had three groups. We had ones who were fishing. We had ones who were quiet and didn't say anything. And then we had ones who what? Uh, they went and they told those people, listen, what you're doing is not the right thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbid us from doing such an action. So don't do this. But they wouldn't listen. In the Quran, in these verses for Surah Al-A'raf, it says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So these people who were enjoining good and forbidding evil, when the time of the punishment came, because Allah had told them multiple times to stop doing a certain action, and they wouldn't, the Quran says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, فَلَمَّا نَسُوا مَا ذُكِّرُوا بِهِ أَنْجَيْنَا الَّذِينَ يَنْهُونَ عَنِ السُّوءِ Allah says in this, specific verse 
that when they didn't listen to us and they forgot all the signs that we have showed them and the punishment now came and Allah doesn't punish a people unless he gives them so many tries. Allah says we saved one type of people who the one who used to do nahi, who used to tell the others, listen, they forbid them from the evil. So this is one of the benefits the Quran mentions of those who enjoin good, who make sure that those around them are staying on the right path and not going towards the wrong path. Inshallah, we come to one of the best individuals, one of the best personalities to ever do al-amr bil-ma'roof wa nahi an al-munkar. And who is that? That's none other than Sayyid al-Shuhada salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. Al Imam Al Hussein, the grandson of the Holy Prophet of Islam, the one who was nurtured and was raised and was brought up in the house of revelations, he says in his will and he writes a letter to his brother, Al Muhammad ibn Al Hanafiya. He says to him, he says to Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya, إِنَّمَا خَرَجْتُ لِطَلَبِ الْإِصْلَاحِ فِي أُمَّتِي جَدِّي صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ أُرِيدُ أَنْ آمِرْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَأَنْهَا عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ Imam al Hussein, the one who we come and we shed those blessed tears for on nights like this, the one who the heart weeps for. He says in his letter to his brother, Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya. He says to him, I come out and I revolt against Yazid, the tyrant of the time, one for the reformation of the Ummah of my grandfather Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Oh. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And second, he says to enjoin good and forbid evil. And that's exactly what we were talking about today. When Imam al Hussein saw that the time had come and Muawiyah had passed away, the father of Yazid, and Muawiyah had an agreement with his older brother, Imam al Hassan, that when he dies, he's to give the caliphate back to Aba Abdullah or Imam al Hassan if he was still alive at the time. Muawiyah doesn't adhere to what he created with Imam al Hassan. And so, when Yazid came into power, Yazid seeked or he sought to legitimize his authority by doing what? By getting the allegiance of Aba Abdullah al Hussein and some other individuals. But Imam al Hussein's bay'ah, the allegiance, would have legitimized Yazid. That means Imam al Hussein would have said okay to everything that was happening in the time of Yazid. And we said that the believer, he does, he forbids good, he forbids uh, uh, evil, and he enjoins that which is good. And so Imam al Hussein, he saw that the time had come for him. And he had to do it in a way that usually it's not done. In a way where he sacrifices himself for the sake of the religion. Why? So that the Ummah wakes up. So that the Ummah can ask itself and reevaluate. Why did the grandson of Muhammad, the man who brought this religion, the man who in the Quran it says, لا أسألكم عليه أجرا إلا المودة في القربة. The one who, the Quran says that the Prophet asks for nothing. For nothing. Except what? Except مودة, which is love towards his kinship. صلوا على محمد وآله. Inshallah, can you just turn on the echo, if there's echo? <clears throat> the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, in the Quran, it says that I ask for nothing except love towards my kinship. But I ask you, brothers and sisters in attendance, what kind of love did they show the Prophet's family in Karbala? What kind of treatment did they treat 
the family of Rasulullah in Karbala. There's a heartbreaking story before we go into the musibah of the Ahlul Bayt. There's a heartbreaking story of one time when the when the Abbasid Caliph of the time burned the house of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. It was in the time of Imam al-Sadiq. And he burned the house of Imam al-Sadiq. And the women of the Imam were running between the house as the house caught on fire. And then the next day, they were eventually able to put out the fire. The next day, they see the Imam saddened. They see the Imam crying in a very sad state. They say to him, oh Imam, this is not the first time someone has the audacity to attack the house of Rasulullah. This is not the first time something like this happens to you. So why are you so saddened? The Imam says to the companion that I am saddened because when this was happening to us and I was with my women, I remembered the women of my grandfather, Abi Abdullah al Hussein. And how they would run from tent to tent without any aid or helper to aid them. Aba Abdullah, moments before he passed away, he would cry out, Allah Halmin Nasrin Yunsuruna, Halmin Mughithin Yughithuna, Halmin Dabin Yadubba and Harami Rasulillah. Is there someone to aid us? Is there someone to protect us? Is there someone that can protect the sanctity of? The women of Rasulullah, what happened to those women after Abu Abdullah al Hussein was killed, after he was slaughtered and martyred on the plains of Karbala? Those very women were attacked in the tents, and the tents would go on fire as they would run from tent to tent and they would try to find their auntie Zainab and they would ask their auntie Zainab for protection for aid, Sayyidah Zainab was now the leader of the women. They had lost everyone except Imam Zainul Abideen, but he was in such a state that the Imam couldn't do anything. He was very ill. And so he wasn't able to protect the woman of his father, Imam al Hussein. <clears throat> oh, Hussein. O oh, Hussein, whose head sits upon the spear, take this greeting from a lover whose heart's in tears. Hussein, ya Hussein. This is the call of Zainab. Hussein, ya Hussein. All of us together now. Hussein. Take your hearts to Karbala. Hussein. Ya Hussein. Brothers and sisters, this is the 40th of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. This marks 40 days since the martyrdom of the Imam. A commemoration of the return of the Imam's household from Damascus to Kalim. Imam al Sadiq, alayhi salam, he says in a narration, the heavens cried 40 days over Abu Abdullah al Hussein. And the earth cried for 40 days by being covered with darkness. And the sun cried 40 days by being in eclipse and turning red for Abba Abdullah. A blessed poet takes us to the scene of Karbala when a companion named Jabir ibn Abdullah al Ansari came to visit the grave of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Jabir visits Karbala while stalled and blind. Grief grips his heart and sorrow torments his mind. He hears a man digging, but what does Jabir find? 
alone weeps Imam Sajjad by the grave of his father. He asks Sajjad, O oh master, what happened here? Why do I find Hussein's grave wet with your tears? Why do I hear that heads were carried on spears? Sajjad takes his hand and weeps. Let me show you, O oh, Jabir. He speaks to Jabir and his voice is shaken. Jabir over here, the Ansar were taken. And no one was left to protect the children. Hussein stood crying their names, and none of them would answer. Over here the woman cried, do you hear them? O oh, Jabir, here they massacred our Qasim. A young boy and the swords towered over him. With armor too big for him, we brought him to his mother. A body looks like Muhammad or Ali. Jabir here, Ali Akbar, was killed thirsty. And within his father's arms, he passed away. Who brought him water at last, Muhammad and Fatima? Did Abbas clench your fingers when he was born? O oh, Jabir, here I saw the moon's arms were torn. Yet only when we lost water, he would mourn. With no flag and with no arms, I buried the flag bearer. O oh, Jabir, don't ask why I returned in dread. I have returned to return my father's head. O oh, Jabir, his grave weeps from the blood he's bled. When I buried him, he cried, bring to me Ali al -Azhar. A man named Atiyah, he was with Jabir ibn Abdullah. On the 20th of Safar, they arrive to Karbala. Jabir performs the ghusl in the Euphrates River, and he changes into a pure shirt, and he applies some scent to him so that he smells nice. And then he walks towards the gravesite of Abha Abdullah. He would recite, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Assalamu alaykum ya ala Rasulillah. He would cry out, Hussein, ya Hussein. Hussein, ya Hussein. Hussein, ya Hussein. He would call out, Hussein, my beloved. Hussein, Habibun la yujibu habiba. Can it be ya Aba Abdullah that a lover of you comes to your presence and you do not return their salam, ya Aba Abdullah? And then Jabir would say, but what can you return, O oh, Hussein, with a head that was severed from your body, and the blood that was stained on your beard and body, as you laid on the sands of Karbala. How can he return salutations, O oh, Jabir? When the swords and the spears pierced the body of Abba Abdullah, and then the horses trampled on that body, which Rasulullah used to carry, which used to sit on the back of Rasulullah when he would pray, and he would prolong his sujood so that Hussein wouldn't fall off his back. Jabir being in the land of Karbala, 
They see a caravan coming from far. He asks, Atiya, oh, Atiya, see who it is. Is it the enemy or is it the caravan of our beloved Master Hussein? He comes back to him, O oh, Jabir, rise and welcome the women of Rasulullah. Imam Zainul Abideen has come along with their women. Jabir rose and he began to walk barefoot towards the Imam. He would, the Imam would ask him, are you Jabir? He would say to him, yes, O son of Rasulullah. The Imam said, O oh, Jabir, it is here our men were killed. It is here that our children were slaughtered. It is here that our women were taken captive and our, our tents were burnt on this land. Ya Aba Abdullah al Hussein. There's one more person we want to remember tonight, and that is Ummul Masaib, Sayyida Zainab alayha salam. I can only imagine the difficulty and the pain when she came back towards the land of Karbala. What did she remember? Did she remember the banner that fell near the Euphrates? Did she remember the severed hands that lied on the plains of Karbala? Did she remember the dismembered body of Ali and Al-Akbar, her nephew? Did she remember the young Qasim who resembled his father, Hassan? Or did she remember her own children that she sacrificed on the plains of Karbala? We will recall the moment Sayyida Zainab bid farewell to her brothers on the plains of Karbala. As if she says to them, from your horse this and my brother, this is the trust from my mother, your chest the horses will smother, between us this is the goodbye. Between us, this is the goodbye. Your neck and chest to me reveal. Let me embrace and your heart I feel. Before they bring the rods of steel. And we lose your love tonight. And we lose your love tonight. I see the children in their fright. Where is the moon on this night? Even the stars I do not sight. Dark is the road ahead, my dears. Dark is the road ahead, my dears. Not just the tents, but even my veil. They will attack when they prevail. I call, where are you, my avail? Near the Euphrates, won't you rise? Ya Abbas, near the Euphrates, won't you rise? My eyes, they see you on the ground. Why don't I hear from you a sound? Abbas, please rise and turn around. It is Zainab calling for you. It is Zainab calling for you. Ya Abbas, Zainab is calling, answer her. As if Al-Abbas would reply, My heart, O oh Zainab, you broke. My heart, O oh Zainab, you broke. When all alone and hurt you spoke. And on your words I now choke. Towards the river don't you gaze. Towards the river don't you gaze. If you gaze there, O Zainab, you're going to see his severed arms, the arrow in his eye, the arrow in his chest, 
the banner of Abba Abdullah on the ground. My heart, O oh Zainab, you broke when all alone and hurt you spoke. And on your words I now choke. Towards the river, don't you gaze. Towards the river, don't you gaze. This is a trial from God to try. If you see my arms, don't you cry. Stand from afar and say your goodbye. Near the river, don't you arrive. Near the river, don't you arrive. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Wa sayalam al-lazeena zalamu. Ayyamun qalabun wa qalabun wa al-aqibatu lil-mustaqeen. Brothers and sisters, <coughs> Allow us to raise our hands together sincerely. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the sake of the blessed tears that were shed tonight, by the sake of Abba Abdullah al Hussein, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless everyone in attendance, the visitation of Abba Abdullah. There's a beautiful narration that says, attributed to Imam al Sadiq, he says that on the day of judgment, there will be no one except that they wish they were from the Zuwar of Aba Abdullah. When they see the reward, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give those Zuwar. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the sake of Imam al Hussein. We ask him to cure all those who are ill, especially those in attendance. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to relieve those who are oppressed around the world, especially around the Islamic world. We ask Allah to relieve the oppression there. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect and to preserve our respected maraja, the jurists who guide us towards the haq. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prolong in their lives. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give tawfiq to this beautiful center. And we ask him to bless the organizers for organizing a majlis like this. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten in the reappearance of the Imam Sahib al Asri wa Zaman, Ajal Allah Ta'ala Farajul Sharif. And we reward this majlis for all those who have passed away on the wilaya of Amir al Mu'mineen, especially your beloved deceased ones. We bless them and we reward them with the majlis of what we recited today, plus Surah Al Mubarakatul Fatiha, but before it, the loudest of your salawat. Oh.